when he fell in the middle and caught the line without a harness was definitely nerve-wracking. How would you describe Spencer? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Spencer's crazy. Spencer's not crazy. I need to think about this for a second. I knew that Andy had the world record longest free solo. I had been free soloing, and this was, I looked at it and I said, this is the world record mark. Every single step I took, I let out a grunt. It was like, ah! Yeah, it wasn't just this like peaceful <sighs> walk across. It was like me and the line bucking it out, you know? <sighs> okay, rigging is correct, yes. I've walked it, I know that I'm capable, yes. I can catch the line, yes. Okay, if I fall off, I'm gonna die. Yes. Okay, let's go. The rope is free! What? The rope is free! Ah, shit! Liam's fallen into a crevasse, and I immediately thought he was dead, or at least seriously hurt. And my guts had been ripped out of my body and were being contained by my flight suit. I know a mountain lion is on top of me. Welcome to another Wilderness Entertainment Wednesday. I'm your host, Vinny Tukrox. Welcome to the show where we tell entertaining wilderness adventure stories. And boy, do we got an entertaining one today. Special thanks to Levi Allen, who produced the phenomenal film, Untethered. I use a lot of his footage in this YouTube video. Well worth the watch. If you want to help support my guest, Spencer, then you go to Slack Life BC. That is Slack Life BC. Check out his awesome company. And if you want to help support the show, you know what to do. You go to the Apple Podcast, you leave a rating, and you leave a review. And if you don't want to, then you can go fuck yourself. And you can subscribe on YouTube. And if you don't want to, then you fuck yourself. Doesn't matter because this is a great episode. Thanks for watching. Spencer Seabrook fucking sick to have somebody in the studio in my basement here <laughs> yeah man thanks for having me what i'm psyched about is well a you're the first like live person that we're having on b second time drinking on the podcast it's gonna be good and thirdly <laughs> i think this is like the probably the gnarliest if not the second gnarliest story we had a girl with like her guts ripped out off of a helicopter she like, wins yeah she was like, she was <laughs> yeah she, she gets like, it yeah she had like what your body could have looked like if you didn't succeed at yeah, your, your endeavors but what's gonna be cool about this is we're gonna break down this event that you did. And I think you're gonna do a good job at dissecting why it's rational. Yeah. But I think it's important for the viewers to remember that what you did is fucking bananas. Okay, <laughs> I, I think like we can't forget that. <laughs> We're gonna try to objectify and make sense of it all. But in the end of the day, what you did is you walked a slack line and I have the stats here, correct me if I'm wrong, 64 meters, 210 feet in length. So yeah. that's where you crossed. And that is while hovering 951 feet that's 290 meters off the deck. That's correct. And that's right in town here in Squamish. Yeah, yeah, up on the Chief. Yeah, those numbers are correct. Okay. Yeah. Now, how do you pick that mission as that's what I want to do? <laughs> I mean, really, it all started with just slacklining itself, you know, and when I started doing it, I was inspired by Andy Lewis. I had seen the real rock uh, where he was on it, and it's like I had been climbing for a couple of years, and. I always found that when I got to the top, I was lacking like this feeling that I should have like, great, I'm up here. But like what the, you know, I wish I had something else to do when I got there. And when I saw Andy and sorry, is that sketchy Andy? Yeah. Sketchy. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, I saw the, like what he was doing and it just appealed to me, you know, and I walked out of there with this like spark inside of me and yeah, I immediately started slacklining and, um, as soon as I started slack lining, I started high lining first just in the trees. And then my first mission was like up on uh, the camel and like on the North Shore range next to Crown Mountain. Um, so it was like the real deal. I didn't just like, you know, pussyfoot my way into it. I like did it in the trees, took a whipper and I'm like, okay, I trust it. Let's take it up high. And as soon as I got comfortable, I started free soloing because I felt like that was just the natural progression of what we were doing. Like you'd walk a line until you were comfortable. And then the ultimate was to free solo. Wait, right off the bat, you're like, oh yeah, that was the goal, right? That's like what you do that I just assumed. Like, I mean, yeah, you know, what else do you do? How do you make it harder? How do you make it more challenging? But after sharing a few free soloing videos online and having like the backlash, I realized that, oh, okay, this isn't just like a normal thing that everybody does. <laughs> Wait, so how many slack lines did it take before you are already 
hopping on without uh like, some of like my first high lines um once i was walking like 20 or 30 meters on a high line i figured okay i could walk half of that free solo so i'd walk like a 15 meter line free solo because i'm like well fuck if i can walk this 30 meter back and forth and of course i could walk this one without falling so how many times how many slack lines per se would you say before you unclipped you you detached yourself i mean high lines probably like five or something but yeah but you know once you're on it you just i don't know yeah you feel it or you're i don't know <laughs> feeling it <laughs> Jeez. all right yeah so did you practice quite a bit at least in training on lower you know just the regular slack line yeah, for sure. Like I, I was at it hard when I first started. That's all I did. I just, that's all I did. I'd get off work and just slackline every weekend. It was just, you know, dreaming up the next mission. We went to uh, Cypress Falls Park in West Vancouver and there's a canyon and some waterfalls and it's like, it's just perfect. You know, there's all sorts of lengths and you could rig everything naturally just from tree to tree. And we started going there a lot and, and you just had a range of different sizes. And like, you know, in my brain, I'd look and be like, okay, it's water. So like, yes, it's like, you know, 20 meters high, but like if I fell, it's water. It's still 20. Yeah, I know, of course. High. Yeah. But I mean, there's certain ways I would like justify in my head that it would be okay, even if I fell. And that's how I kind of got the feel for it. And then, and then from there, you just take it higher about, then it's more about trusting, catching the line if you are to fall. So wait, the, the opportunity I had to get in touch with you was through your now ex, unfortunately. Yeah. At her slack line well it's not hers but she was slack lining at the falls the mamcoin falls oh yeah yeah at have you done that one yeah i've walked that line yeah okay. i haven't free soloed it okay yeah no how high would you say that is that's probably like 10 15 meters high that's so not super 20. high well yeah i mean but it's yeah it was probably similar to that or around you know they, they would range in different heights for sure i'm gonna throw it yeah okay. oh it's not but it's like i don't know it's the line that you're on. You're not focusing on what's below you. It's like you look ahead and it's like, man, if you can walk it, you can walk it. It's like you could walk down a curb every day of your life. And then all of a sudden you take everything away from either side of the curb. And it's like, yes, is it scary? But you also know that you can do it. So just do it. <laughs> so how many hours would you say you've put in slack lining or just being on a line in general before you do your first high line where you could die untethered? That's, it, it's going to range for every person as they get into it. But for me, it was probably like, I mean, combined in hours, it was probably only like a day of slacklining, really, of like probably 24 hours. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Before you hop on a high line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What but it's fuck? more, if, it's like when, when you're feeling it, you feel it, you know? It's, and think about 24 hours of slacklining combined is probably over like a month or two months, right? It's like when you think about putting in a couple hours, it's like, an hour here, an hour there. It takes a little while before you get to 24. And, you know. We're talking 24 hours, like feet on a line. I'm saying, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, Not okay. like the first day, yeah, just okay, all okay. of a sudden. Okay, okay. But I mean, nowadays, like that was me starting then. That was like eight years ago when I started. And uh, there was nobody around doing it. Like a lot, some of my oldest friends that I have from around here, I met through slacklining. There's some like the OGs that like were the only slackliners in town. And I learned a bunch from them. And then I got limited to where I could learn anything else. And I had to start figuring things out for myself. So like when I rigged my first high line, it was like, you know, what I could Google slash actually understand. You know, I had friends that are very smart and I'm not saying that I'm not smart, but you know, friends with, you know, a degree in math physics can explain how this anchor works and, and how you could do it in a different way. And it could be really bad, you know? Mm. Yeah. Like learning to do a sliding X is like, a, 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 that, that's all you really need to know. You know, <laughs> was there some sketchy shit going on back then? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I've done a lot of sketchy shit. To be honest, even now I feel like I, I, the way I rig things, it's like, I know that it's good enough, but some people's ideals uh, have changed and they want, you know, a certain safety factor. And they've like, there's been enough testing that they're like, okay, this is what we should all do. And it's like, eh. mm. you know, so some people actually feel sketchy using my rigging, but everyone also knows that it's totally fine. <laughs> Yeah, it's this weird thing, you know, but it's 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 funny. It's it's almost like a, a bit of a joke in a way, because I'm just like I'm a bit older now in the community. I have like, you know, a lot of experience, but I'm also known for like, I don't know. Yeah. Making it work. <laughs> 
like they're sketchy Andy, you're like spicy Spence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's not unsafe, it's just a yeah. little spicy. But it's about understanding what you're doing, you know? The, the first bit of highlining is the most scary because all you're thinking about is gear and like, is it going to blow out? And it's like, after you go out on a high line, you take a couple whippers, you bounce around, you're like, it's fine. I can actually like let go and then you're not thinking about it, right? And that's just the key of any sport that's like dangerous that you're relying on some sort of safety to back you up, right? But then, yeah, once you get used to it, it's just, fuck, it's a highway, you know? Like, you know that it's good and, and it's fine. Just trust it. So what we're here to really talk about is what was depicted in that movie, Untethered. Mm-hmm. And I'm French-Canadian. I'm, dude, I'm struggling so much to pronounce Untethered. You should have mentioned that. I wouldn't have come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Dude, the I'm cheese kidding. is just overflowing. I, I, live, I live with a couple of French-Canadians as well. They're the worst. Um, <laughs> anywho, so... How long had you been slacklining before you saw this mission, the untethered mission as like, when did it start flirting with your mind? Like, Oh, you know what? Peak two to peak three. Yeah. When I, uh, when I first started, we going up the chief, we go to the North Gully. That's like where, um, people, you know, like long before I was there had established, uh, the line as well as like Dean Potter had established a line there. He's, I mean, obviously world renowned. He's gone now. Dean Potter for all those that don't know is a famous rock climber. Base jumper, slackliner. Base jumper. <laughs> yeah. Pretty extraordinaire. Nerdy. Yeah. He's kind of like the Alex Honnold before Alex Honnold was. Yeah, for sure. But more diversified. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, we used to, you know, before I got told not to, um, we used to camp up at the North Gully all the time. We would just go up there and rig a line and we'd stay there for the weekend. Um, and one time I was up there with a friend, Adam Mertens, and uh, we had just never, I had never been over to the North North Gully. I had always just gone up to the North Gully, rigged a line and stayed there. And uh, one day I walked over to the, to the North North and like, Oh my God, man, it was like a whole new world. And it compared to what the North Gully was, North Gully is about, you know, 30 meters across at the small, small part. And if you want to go beyond that, it's like a hundred meters kind of in any other direction. So we weren't even looking, we weren't even thinking that, but we went over to the North North and it's like these you know, 50, 60, 70 meter range. And this is like the perfect stepping stone. Oh God, I'm going to throw up. I I remember looking at, it's called the itis is the line that I'd walked. We'll get to that, the name. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I remember sitting there with Adam and looking at it and going, I knew that Andy had the world record longest free solo. I had been free soloing and this was, I looked at it and I said, this is the world record line. The first time I ever like looked across the gap and it took a long time after that for it actually so happened, sorry. but what was Aunt sketchy Andy's? It was 55 meters. And you knew and it just was, by eyeing it, that was longer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had a uh, range finder. So by putting my eye to the range finder, I would see the length. And okay, okay. so I kind of knew I, I had planted that seed and I have this thing about me where when I say that I'm going to do something out loud, it's like, I get anxiety about it. Like I have to do it. You know, that is, so before I actually, say it out loud. I definitely think about a lot of things and I think about whether or not I'm serious and whether or not I want to plant this seed into the world. And, and once I do, it becomes very serious and I take it seriously. And, uh, yeah, there's very few things that I've said out loud that, uh, I haven't done yet. (laughs) Yet. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to say on the podcast? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So when did you decide to verbalize it and make it a reality and what got you there at that moment that moment that moment when i saw the the gap on you're like yeah this is it this is this is it so in untethered you see adam mertens is is being interviewed he's the the curly-haired hippie uh talking and um he said that line like after i had said that you know he knew that i was on that that train and and he says they're like what's up what's what's Spencer going to next and he's like world record free solo that's what he's doing but he said that like you know before the solo happened so it's like super cool the timeline of like me being up there with him me saying that to him him calling it out on you know recorded you know on video and then it actually happening it's like really cool to have that impression so okay now you've decided you're gonna do this 
Mm -hmm. or you've verbalized it. Yeah. What comes next? Well, is it training? Training, visualizing. You know, once I was soloing like the lines in the North Gully that are like equally as high, but not nearly as long. I, you know, when I first started soloing, I would go one way and I'd step off the other end and it'd be this release, you know, because the whole time you're fighting your adrenaline and everything is peaking inside of you, but you're like... <sighs> You know, just staying calm, dial, your life depends on it. And you step off the other side and it's just this like fucking explosion, you know, you feel all of that adrenaline, you feel just so jacked. So I had to learn to maintain that, that, uh, mind state for a little bit longer. So rather than stepping off and getting jacked up, I would step off, breathe, relax, get back on the line and go back. And then I would do it again, you know? And so just spending more time in that headspace was the hardest thing. And what is your technique to basically cool down your adrenaline. Is that what you're doing? You're managing it's, it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I don't know. Yeah. I can't really explain how, how it is. You just try. I don't know. Like most people get excited, but you need to just adrenaline is actually like what turns you into su superhuman. Your, your reaction times better. You know, you're just way more aware. Like every you're dialed in, in this moment, but only if you know how to harness it, otherwise it becomes anxiety. Right. And, and that's fear. Fear is adrenaline. That's like what your heart rate goes up. You feel uneasy. You're not really sure. And you're like, fuck me, you're dialed is what it is. And as long as you're not actually afraid, you could justify your self being in that position. You learn to use it as this super drug. You know, you just become dialed. It's. Could it be a negative impact though in, in the slack yeah, line yeah, situation? You know, yeah, of course. If you're not in control of your own situation, then, then yeah, the adrenaline will get the best of you. And like I have when early on in my soloing days when I soloed Dean's line for the first time. What's Dean's line? Dean's line is next to the original. Uh, that's in the North Gully and it's the line that Dean Potter established. And it was really important for me to free solo it because Dean Potter free soloed it. And I really, I the video of him doing Doing it just like inspired me and there's a video on the slack life bc youtube channel yeah, i'll put it up for the youtube yeah, sweet yeah. that uh, of me walking it and it's all one clip unedited and it's me getting onto it taking a couple steps and then actually jumping back to like the cliff it, it it's deceiving in the video i was more okay than it looks <laughs> um and then I get well, back. What do you mean? What happens in the video? Well, I like take a couple of steps and then I like just kind of step off the line back towards. And it looks like I'm on the edge of the cliff, but really there's a few more feet of rock that are just kind of out of the, that you can't see. So it looks really fucked when I jump back onto the rock, but it's not that bad. But then I is walk the out into the line. No, this is at the very at the beginning, the, the very beginning. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and this is my first up. attempt at soloing it. And so uh, I then, you know, kind of grunt, get stoked. All right, I'm doing it. I step back on the line. I start walking. I'm out over the edge. Um, I'm in the middle, and all of a sudden, I'm I the, my adrenaline got the better of me, and I my legs started shaking. And I took one step that I shouldn't have taken. Like I was shaking, and when I should have just caught the line, sat down and caught the line. Instead, I'm like, no, no, and I like force myself to take a step. And then all of a sudden, I look forward, and the line is just going whoop, 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 back and forth. And that's just my nerves. And so I I just drop, catch the line, I swing underneath the whole thing, and then come back up, and then just shimmy back to the beginning and <laughs> step off. Line laugh, grunt, high five my buddy, and then get back on it and walk all the way across. <laughs> all right. So I think it's important for us to break down these catches because I'll put the video up of you on untethered. Yeah. But basically for anybody that wouldn't watch, I would assume it's holy shit this all went <laughs> to crap he's gonna die now but basically you guys learn to catch the line and i interviewed your friend so we'll, we'll play a little clip <laughs> here and she oh kinda, yeah she kind of explains a little bit about catching there's probably plenty of slack players out there that they go on lines and they don't catch and they're really very slow very focused and not want to catch it's just you stand up you walk you get off and i think spencer was never afraid of catching kind of a reset you know you sit down you didn't feel at that time you didn't feel comfortable to take that step you catch the line you reset and then okay I'm ready to go now and I think that kind of shows how strong mentally Spencer is to free solo is that he's able to kind of refocus and like no this didn't feel right I want to sit down take a breath stand up again and try it again people love to say that he almost died and he fell and <laughs> he caught the line and make it sound all crazy but it was all very controlled 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's break it down. Cause like in this solo attempt, like, or not attempt, but at the start, yeah, you fall. In my first attempts. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. fall. Is it a couple times? Yeah. Twice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically I stood up and fuck man, 64 meters across and 300 meters high. I was like, oh, I was feeling it, you know, it hit me hard. Um, so I just, yeah, I got nervous and I sat down wasn't feeling it. And then I fucking screamed. I let out this like, Bruh! you know, like from, from like deep, and I stood up again and I took one more step, one step and then another step. And I just, <laughs> and I fell down again. And then, um, well, I didn't fall. I look, I looked down at the line, put my hands on it before my feet are off of it and then wrap, split my legs and then wrap my legs around it. You know, it's very controlled. And at that point I had taken two steps forward. So before I started, I shimmied back those, those two steps and, uh, yeah. And then stood up and it was just fucking it was dialed at that point but it's just shaking it it's trusting your gear learning to trust your gear at that point the gear was my hands you know when you take a whipper on your rope when you're climbing you become you're like a little looser you know you're like yeah all right all right now i'm ready you know and it's the same thing it's like fuck man what if i get out there and i get scared you know oh, like oh my god and it's like you just have to go out there and check your gear a couple of times and then after that you're going to be a little bit more reassured so you almost think it was necessary as like a warm-up Maybe I, I did wasn't like intentionally doing it. I would have much rather just stood up and gone. But let's be real, man. It wouldn't have nearly as many views on YouTube if if I hadn't have done that. It's true. Yeah, and that <laughs> picture's famous of you like your legs sprawled out, like grabbing the line. Oh, dude, the headlines are hilarious. You know, almost dies when he slips. It's like, at what point did I slip? You know, I don't know. I never saw myself slip. Well, never slipped. The other thing that Maya here breaks down is. You guys, and I'm not a slackliner, but you guys know the point where you can catch and where you're pushing it too far and you're just going to get fucking catapulted off the thing. Yeah. So how do you know? What's the feeling? Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, when you're walking with a leash on, um, you can fight it until you fall off, you know? And then, so to progress to soloing, I'm just going to need to inject this. (laughs) Sometimes you do, you tie into things that would still save your life, but you definitely don't want to fall onto. So you like tie the rope around your ankle right? instead of to a harness or like just around like this belt. I have tied the rope around that specific belt, this specific belt. That yeah. Specific I've, belt I'm wearing it life. untethered as well. I, I, I walk is with that this. belt in untethered. Yeah, for sure. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's worked. It's, it's held enough times. You know, I, I double it back and, and, uh, and then you tie into that and it's like, yes, you do not want to fall, but if you do, that's okay. So, Basically, when you're dude, walking, that belt is fucking thin, man. <laughs> yeah, it's the same, dude. It's the same as what your harness is made of. I guess. Yeah, yeah. That when you fucking uh, buckle, better be metal. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is for sure. Okay. It's made for. It's called the danger. I got belt. a Walmart. I don't know. It's no. Metal. It was bought at the, at the climbing store. It's metolius. You know, it's like it's okay, 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 okay. A couple okay. bar tacks in it. Okay, okay. They'd probably hold. But I'd never want to see if it... Oh, you never have I've never fallen, fallen on okay. it. Fuck no. No, it's the whole idea, right? It's like training your brain to walk without a leash. So you walk with something that's like less than ideal to fall on. And that's going to kick your ass into doing it. But if you do actually fall. So it's like this kind of this backup, you know, it's like... A, or you tie it around one ankle, loop it underneath the line and tie it to your other ankle. That's called shackles. Oh my God. Yeah. So anyway, Wait, doesn't that, that back doesn't, to where we were... Yeah, that didn't crisscross though, the shackles thing? Like uh, no, no, not until you turn around and you come back. True, but if you leave true. enough slack, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, when you're walking with a leash on, you'll just fight until you fall. If you have a swami belt on, you're you're walking like you're soloing, but you also have that extra little bit. You're like, ah, I'm kind of still tied in. All of a sudden, you're free soloing, and man, it's like if you go anywhere outside of perfect you're catching you're not fighting to try to stay on it you know it's like you're fucking dialed that's it so there's this like you know i'd say that you <laughs> i just picture it in the lines you know and the person standing there it's like you can stay within this gap and pre-solo and you're fine you get out to there and it's like maybe with a swami belt you'd fight that far and then without a leash on you just like it's infinite you know like you could just you mean with a leash on with a leash yeah, on yeah. yeah you can you'll surprise yourself how easy it is to actually stay on when you're like, Oh my God, I'm going to fall. And then you just be patient. You're like, Oh, all right. You know, I guess I'll keep walking, but I would never do that free soloing. So it's parallel lines, basically. Yeah. That's like you're that's staying within your box. At. Yeah, exactly. And the, the box just gets wider 
as the safety as the safety increases yeah mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. pretty rational yeah, yeah. but it's still bananas it's, we're gonna remember that this is fucking bananas so wh- how do you pick the day like is it weather is it is it seasonal as well yeah i mean it just kind of you know that the times would come i always have these ideas in my head and you're kind of slowly working towards them planning visualizing and then the time comes and you know you go for it at the time we had a hundred meter line rigged kind of right next to it that i had never walked and we also had that line rigged and i stepped on the hundred meter and i was kind of and then i i struggled in the first like i don't know just few times trying to stand up and then i thought to myself okay like it's either I put all my energy into doing this or I do what I like really came here to do. So I went back, I untied. And uh, at the time, the drone operator guy literally had like just arrived. It had just like this perfect timing. And I was like, okay, dude, I'm like, I'm going to do a walk on the line and then I'm going to take my harness off and I'm going to free solo it. And, and then that's what I did. I won't talk about breaking down the actual walk and the drone will come up because I think that could throw some stuff up. But I, I do want to talk about just the technique of, uh, slack line. At this point, like, what have you developed as far as real pro techniques of slack lining? Because, you know, you're always learning, right? Like rock climbing, it's, I've been doing it for maybe four or five years. And just now, am I really comprehending how much like you can utilize your core in different aspects? Like even walking a slab, just keeping it tight Yeah. on a shitty foot, it just keeping that core tight sucks you onto the rock, right? Yeah. What are some of those like micro techniques that you have developed as an experienced slack liner that most, you know, potential beginners haven't really unraveled yet. Yeah. Well, I find that, um, looking forward and where you're looking has always been like a very important thing in learning slack lining, but it wasn't until I did it blindfolded that I realized how much the visualization actually throws you off, um, in, in a longer line sense or in high lining because it's so crazy. And so well, I've learned to focus on where my head is, you know, and that's it. It's like literally keeping your whole body stacked and there's times to, to break down and be loose and, 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 and move dramatically. And there's times to just be locked and, and dialed. And it's literally just like, where is your head? Cause when you're blindfolded and walking a line, you, you have nothing to look at. And all you can do is like, just think about where your, where your head is, you know, and that literally it, that's all it is keeping your head above your feet. Right. That's it. It's like, and it's just so simple. And you'll be doing these, you'll be fighting, you'll be over to the side and you're like, oh my God. It's like, wait. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm back. It's like literally that easy. It's really a lot of in the neck, the head, like the micro adjustment yeah, of the head like position. Your, you know, like your shoulders and head. It's like, where are you? Like, yeah. Yeah. Look where you want to go. And I thought it was all about monkey arms. Well, I mean, no, I mean, if you, if you're swinging your arms around, then you're like fighting the balance really like your arms can be like down and relaxed. I always found if I opened my palms up, it brought my, my elbows in and dropped my arms. So whenever the first thing that gets tired for me when I'm walking a really long high line is my shoulders. Cause it's this constant, like just small little tweaking, you know? And yeah, the best thing you can do to relax, I was fine is put my palms up and it just like brings my elbows down and in and, and then you're just like calm you know subtle you should be able to walk without moving your arms just stay locked you know when you get dialed you can just run across it one thing maya mentioned is she timed you and it was approximately is it four minutes do you know the exact time? yeah something like that yeah i don't remember the exact time but it was actually faster than when i had a harness that's on. what she said yeah <laughs> but yeah. dude i remember her saying that because i thought you know in the video i don't know if they actually played the whole four minutes in the video but i remember I didn't, I never thought it was that long. Like for me, that sounds like decades. It's because it's so intense. Like your life is literally on the line for four fucking minutes of concentration. Four minutes. Does that, how much would you say that feels like to you? Does it feel like four or does it feel like 30? Uh, no, it felt like a minute, you know, it felt like pretty quick. Like it's just in sections, stand up. Okay. I'm standing, I'm walking. Oh my God. I'm in the fucking middle. Whatever. Stay focused. It's like, oh, almost there. Just keep going. You know, and you're like, holy fuck. I'm at the end, but stay focused. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's just in these like increments. And I also like, you don't hear it in the video because of the, I mean, there's a drone playing. So they've cut audio of me from another walk into it That's to make figured. it more dramatic, yeah, of course. Yeah. But every single step I took, I let out a grunt. 
It's like every, it was probably the loud, you'd, yeah, you wouldn't even hear the drone over the audio probably. Every step it was like, ah! you know, it was like, it wasn't just this like peaceful whew, walk across. It was like me and the line bucking it out, you know? Now, why is that? Why? Because I was fucking scared, you know? It was like, I was, I knew I was capable. I was solid. I wasn't going to let my uh, adrenaline get the better of me, you know? I was fucking doing it i'd come this far and it's just like for me that's what i do you know like other people are different and for me it's like i'll let out a grunt i hate that anxiety that built up tension you get when you're nervous or when you're scared and i believe like fucking letting it out is so important so important you know but you wouldn't necessarily do that normal highlining yeah, yeah, I mean, if I'm fighting, if, yeah. if you're like at that moment when you're about to fall, like I was talking about, and you're like fighting to bring it back, then you're, yeah, as soon as you let out a grunt, it's when you're like, you have that built up tension, that anxiety, you know, like they do it in karate, they teach you to like let it out. And it's like, there's a reason for that, you know? I do it too sometimes. I do it when I'm really pushing it and I'm on the verge of, it's, it, usually, honestly, when I climb my hardest climbs, I don't power scream it's odd yeah but when i'm really trying super hard and i'm a little honestly it's when i'm a little scared too yeah it's to psych myself out do you think there is like was there fear doing this 100 percent. yeah that's why i mean i mean yeah (laughs) i don't know yeah it definitely there was fear 100 percent. but there was also enough confidence to push forward because like if we break down alex honald right he's like the whole solo climber yeah he always says, like, if you get to the point of being scared, while, like, he's scared before, but when you're on it and doing it, there shouldn't be fear. But I don't see how that is necessarily translatable to slacklining. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I hear what he's saying, but there's, there is a level of fear. Like, fucking fuck off, Alec. Like, I don't care what you say, dude. Like, yes, of course. Yeah, I would, it's that, yes, fear, but confidence. It's like, so you're saying you're just completely calm and, like, just cruising. It's like, yeah, in a sense, just like I was also completely calm and cruising, but I was also, like, fighting the fact of, you know, human evolution has brought us to a point to know that I shouldn't be here doing this. And no matter how many times I've done it or built up to this, it's just simply not going to just be a fucking walk in the park <laughs> so glad you said that because if you if you said you weren't i was gonna be like you're a fucking liar yeah exactly <laughs> hey, i'm calling him out all right <laughs> <laughs> i'm calling Arnold out. Yeah. so when you get him on the podcast you can bring that up okay yeah yeah, yeah. yo a slack liner says you're full of shit <laughs> um, but one of the classic things that soloists try to say is uh and maya said it actually when i, I talked to her briefly she was like you know the risk of slacklining, you know, you can compare it to, and they always say this, it's like the motto of soloing in any sport. It's just like driving down the highway, driving down the highway is sketchier. There's more factors that you can't control. But when you're slacklining, most factors, unless you know, even if a bird flies by, most factors you're kind of controlling. Mm-hmm. Would you kind of agree with that? Too? Yeah. The way I always put it is me free soloing is like me driving down a highway without a seatbelt on, but nobody else is on it and I paved it myself, mm. you know? And it's, so it's like, yeah, I and mean, you know that you're in control and, but what are like the real risks? Most people would do that. If they had an open highway, they'd go, fuck yeah, I'll take my seatbelt off and drive as fast as I can. It'd be scary, but they also know that they're in control because they've done it so many times, you know? But then you add other things and, you know, things that could, could happen. And, and that's where people are ignorant in life. You know, how many people die in the sea, the sky highway or snowboarding or, you know, snowboarding at Whistler, you know, it's like, like literally, and then mountain biking, you know, it's like, there's so many, I mean, climbing, you know, people, it, these are all regular day things now they're all like normal it's normal for you and your friends to go to the climbing gym and then progress a little bit now we're climbing outside it's like are you actually aware of the risks that you're taking you know because it's so normal but you know i feel like whenever we're doing these like elevatedly dangerous things we're so aware of all of the things that are actually dangerous to us and we mitigate all of these risks through training and practice and proper rigging and experience you know yeah Mm mm-hmm it is crazy though like even even now i think just the other day what did i oh yeah i was lowering some a climber and it it was like a a 35 meter route and the rope was 70 so she was gonna make it back down but i didn't we didn't neither of us 
mostly me as a belayer didn't tie a knot and right. <laughs> I wasn't looking I just like felt it in my hand I was like oh, and I like pinched it the tip of it with my hand I was like but and she was pretty much on the ground she yeah. was on the ground to be yeah. on but on kind of a ledge and I was like oh like these are the things these yeah. are the fucking things <laughs> <laughs> you forget to check your oil on your car and then yeah. you explode on your your man-made highway you know <laughs> yeah uh, yeah I, I do want to break down though the day so how do you pick a day like does the tension matter because does that have to be super specific that you've trained on it tension on the line yeah you want it to be relative you know you're not going to get onto it and just on site solo it when you haven't felt the line before so like at that on that day i had walked it a few times i felt like it might need a little bit more tension i tensioned it i walked it with the leash and then i free soloed it that was so it's like you know it needs to be relative um and the tension does change as you walk it in different temperatures and humidity and this you know it all changes in the slightest ways you know not super crazy but uh yeah i felt like it was important to just be current with it you know i wasn't gonna walk it a bunch kind of fuck off and do whatever and then just come back i was gonna be like walking with a leash picture visualizing being solo and then just take it off and then solo it what about winds uh the winds were low um typically in squamish it's either north or south um going through the valley and the the north gully or the the north north is like well protected um so you might get a little you know swirling a little rotor wash but it wasn't super windy on that day and it on a line that length it wouldn't make a huge deal as long as it wasn't like ripping you know mm. but still you were going for the world record free solo i feel like everything's got to be kind of perfect are you wearing like the same clothes? I had shoes. I listened to music. Um, and, uh, I had, you know, my hat, there's like certain things. Yeah. I'd feel like, you know, we're, we're like at the time I had these fucking ripped up climbing pants and, and these old Lakai skate shoes. And, um, yeah, like I, you know, in a way of, of like, uh, you know, a lot of sports people, they'll have like their favorite socks or their underwear right. that's like a little bit superstitious. And it's like, yeah, everything had to be kind of right, you know, but it's not, you know, at that time, it's not like I was picking through some wardrobe and that's what it was. That's pretty much all I wore every day. So what was the song you're listening to? I, I honestly don't even remember. You don't remember the song? No, you fucking... it, was a, it was some mix. It was like some, some mix that was just some like mellow, like house just like i don't know it was it was mellow yeah like yeah, was, i would it, think it's spiritual music that's what i would go with. yeah like, I'm, I'm not like shows. the most spiritual person or i wouldn't call myself spiritual i'm sure i am in my ways but i'm, I'm just saying the, the vibe no no of course yeah i but it's all i don't know i like to just like i like the happy just kind of like bouncy whatever well honald apparently does it to like metal i don't i don't say you do that yeah i i like listening to dubstep when i'm when i'm walking with the leash on or like whatever i love that it's just like I don't know. It's like powerful. But you don't remember the song once you actually traversed it? No, I mean, like it was on something on my little shitty MP3 player at the time that a friend had put on there. I don't. Interesting. It wasn't significant. I was okay. thinking it was more distraction. I also, I smoke weed and I definitely um, was good and good and medicated at the time. Okay. Yeah. But I also find that that just kind of helps. I mean, like I'm a bit ADHD. So when it comes to like distractions and things like that, it helps focus you know and i always find like the flow state being a little bit easier to find when you're a little when you're a little chonged up you know yeah. now how much weed spencer how much is the right amount of weed before you do the world record <laughs> like, Man, i don't like, think i've wow. ever actually talked about this like in, in in a public way because you know i don't know well, I think it's young good. kids as well i'm not trying to encourage everyone to smoke weed i'm saying for me it works <laughs> yeah well i'll say this like me like some of my best on sighting rock climbing is on weed. Yeah. I become super present. I see the beauty in the movement mm -hmm. and the rock. I'll be yeah. like in love with the crystal. I'm like, yeah. This is the prettiest crystal of all <laughs> crystals. Me and this crystal are one. Yeah. Uh, goodbye, crystal. Next crystal. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not saying that like weed will make you a better slackliner in any way, but if it works for you, then it probably works well. But uh, yeah, at the time, I actually had this like shatter pen and I had this big haul of it. And then that's when I like tensioned the line did it, and I just kind of fell into this flow and. What's a, a shatter band? A shatter pen. So like shatter, it's like super concentrated. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah. It gets you super duper baked, but in the pen, it's only like, it's not, it's not like taking a big dab of it through a bong. It's like just a, you know, just a subtle lungful, but of like some super concentrated uh, stuff. Was it like? Sativa. 
Does it kick you in the dick though? Like oh, stone, yeah. But I, but it's like the same thing. Like you don't get stoned if you're busy. You know, if you want to be, a, if you like smoke weed and sit on the couch and, and watch the TV, you get stoned. You know, but when you have a little puff and you start doing stuff, you're not stoned. You know, you're like, you're just in it. Like you said, you're present. You're you're fo- you're focused. You're like doing your thing. You know, so. But I've also had weed in a sense where it makes you super anxious it's never happened to me rock climbing oddly yeah. like if the few times i have done that rock climbing mm-hmm. it's been good and i don't know i honestly it's usually when i'm indoors that like it's a bad experience like it's like you get that anxiety every yeah day, like, but again that's you know that's the the person on the day the the strain the whatever you know you might have already had some other things going on and whatever man. you know like who knows that your body will speak to you and if it's not feeling it then you're not feeling it <laughs> oh all right so you smoke a little weed you have your music playing yeah and i had to ask my like what was the entourage like and it was kind of interesting because you didn't know my that well at the time no right she was a, a brand new slackliner yeah she, was so she, she, she broke, broke down, down the situation a little bit because <laughs> yeah. i needed to know from a third eyes perspective so. i remember michael maybe say a couple of words of like just saw uh, just breathe relax this is beautiful type of thing i remember him saying a couple of words and it was just silent we were all just there watching and i think i was not really thinking of anything i remember i think michael was actually sitting on this air mattress like camping air mattress that pulled it into chair naked just sitting there <laughs> and i remember looking back and kind of finding it was just a funny funny place funny situation to be in you know i didn't know anybody very well michael was just there chilling sun tanning and Spencer was walking the line. I remember it was quite a, quite just a funny thing when you stop for a second and think about what was going on. Um, <laughs> it was very relaxed, very, very calm, very, I don't know. It was, it was a good. Wait, so, so Michael, which we could almost label as, as like not coach, but you know, as his backup crew was naked that day. Yeah, he was just sitting there. <laughs> Michael's he, naked he most days. Be. It was yeah. not only that day. Like he was always was sun tanning, running around when it was warm. It was just kind of his thing. He still probably does that now. <laughs> yeah. So Michael's just there naked saying like, oh, it's, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful day. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, that's pretty cool because it shows the community and the style of the community. Yeah. I don't think that the typical climber community is like that, which I, that's why I kind of have respect for you guys. Like just briefly meeting um, your ex LJ in that community. It seemed like really more of a fun like party vibe. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I found when I started climbing, uh, one of the bigger things that I found was that I really didn't fit in. Mm. Um, you were telling the story of the 70 meter uh, pitch and you lowering your body. So here's a situation. We're at Penny Lane. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. So, so you need a 70 meter rope or it's ideal for that. Uh, but we only had a 60 meter rope and we had already started climbing it. And literally we realized this when same thing. I'm like got my hand on the bottom. And I'm like, oh shit. Well, hey, you know what? And I'm like, Brent, grab the rope for a second. So my, my buddy comes and just like grabs the rope above my belay. And then I just take him off belay, tie the knot, tie myself into it. And I'm like, okay, good. Let go. And anyway, let's go. And then all these people are looking over at us like, what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> oh my God. And then I'm like, all right, man, whenever you get close, I'm just going to start climbing and then I'll stop for a second. You put me on belay. I don't know, man. To me, it's like, whatever. But of course, you know, some guy's got his fucking opinion and it's like, hey, I get it. You know, we all need to be safe and this and that, but we all trust each other. We can all make fun of our safety but for some reason, I get really bad vibes from everybody yeah, around dude. when we do that. And I think that the, the, the Highline community in general just has a good sense of humor about our safety, yet we do take it very seriously. Mm-hmm. And that's like a big dividing line, I feel like, from the two communities. You'll, well, you, you will get to notice that too. And, and more novice individuals, they don't actually know certain techniques that yeah. are more safe than they appear. I yeah. mean, sh- you're not necessarily cutting corners, but you're doing techniques that... Like same, like I could lower myself on before somebody takes, I could just lower myself on the rope a lot. I'd do that sometimes. I'm yeah. Like, I'm just going to lower over this ledge. So I don't need to yeah. ask for take or whatever, stuff like that. You know, like just brief things or just grab the the rope yourself instead of falling, yeah. you know, things that you shouldn't do, but Hey, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's not train. Like there are, you know, no one's going to teach you to do that, but you also get in the situation. You're like, fuck, that's going to work. So but anyway, <laughs> this dude's naked. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Michael's dick out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> does that put you in a vibe of like more like chill like it it puts some lightness into the day yeah i mean well so i was walking away from them in at the time so they're all back on the ledge and so as i would as i take these catches 
you know, I look back at them and that, you know, that's when Michael, I know he's talking to me, but I've got my headphones in. I don't, I didn't hear exactly what he was saying, you know, and as I'm like shimmying back to take those steps. And then it's like, I'm very aware of the people that are there because of the presence. Yet when I turn and I face the other side, I'm very alone. I'm like, I'm, I'm on my own. I'm walking away from them. I'm, you know, doing it. Yeah. So it was a, it was a good, good feeling. And there was actually a group of people that had stayed up there with us, but they went and rigged a line in the North Gully and a bunch of them kind of had an idea of what I was going to do. And a lot of them weren't comfortable even hanging around. That's what Maya was saying, that there was a group of people there and everyone left except for Maya and... And yeah. Michael and Lee and, and Lee. everybody Lee. Yeah. 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 Understandable. Why do you think that is? Fuck, what do you think, man? They don't want to like see somebody fall off and die or whatever. You know, a lot, not everyone's wired the same. Like just trying to explain myself and how I do things or why I do things. You know, a lot of people just don't understand. A lot of people do. And there's the difference. It's like the person that just doesn't understand doesn't want to watch it. They don't want anything to do with it. They think that somehow it's going to affect them worse if they're there and something bad happens or something, you know, affect but you, I, I mean, or them or whatever, you know, but I also do feel like I feel that energy. Um, I've been around people that are uneasy, like that don't want me to free solo. And I felt that bad energy. I've like put out to people that I was going to free solo girlfriend from years ago um, that I was dating when I did all of this. I don't like telling her that I was going to go free solo Dean's line when I went to go do that. And I'm up there, I'm like getting psyched. And she sends me a message and says like, I really kind of like wish you weren't doing that and this and that. And it's like, eh, I just turned that off. And yeah, that's not going to work. You know, like it's not what I want to hear. It's not what I want to hear at all. And that energy, it puts it out there. And you know, there is something about actually kind of letting go, realizing that the, okay, I'm going to do this. I've trained so hard. I'm ready to do it. <sighs> okay. Rigging is correct. Yes. I've walked it. I know that I'm capable. Yes. I can catch the line. Yes. Okay. If I fall off, I'm going to die. Yes. Okay. Let's go. It's like, it is your checklist. And it's like, you think of your relationships. You think of the last time you talk to your family and shit, you know, and like, it's, I always have been like that. I do, I do that when I go up to base jump now, you know, like if I'm walking by myself, I'm not distracted by talking to other people. I'm literally thinking of like what my last conversation with whoever is or like the way I left something. And that's why I really try to be open and honest always. I don't have a written letter. Like if I go to die, I try to, to express how I feel to people in the moment because it's true. It's honest. And quite frankly, I could die tomorrow. And not only doing one of the dangerous things where I've accepted it, but through some accident, driving down the road, whatever, you know, and I feel like it's just important to stay in like a clear mind state like that, where I feel like I'm not holding on to anything, you know, you should check out my savings account because believe me, I'm not worried about fucking <laughs> about falling and dying and missing out on the money that I've saved because there isn't any, I'm, you know, I'm just like, you live with a intention of like, living, you know, and, and, but I also accept that it could all be ripped away from me in a second. So it's like, I kind of been, I'd stay on this edge of like, I don't know. You don't leave too many things hanging too many loose ends, you know, that's probably that part is a healthy aspect of life that you're aware of the last conversations you've had with different people that matter to you. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's a good thing. Yeah, Cause everyone's got yeah. that pending dispute with somebody that they care about yeah but you're kind of in a state where you can't allow that or you don't want to it affects me if i have that you know that's 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 some something very real yeah i'm a a, i can be an emotional person you know i like i i i don't know i'm very soft-hearted and in ways and and i yeah I'll, i'll be affected by other people's and my drama you know at times so it's it's uh yeah, important for me to just clear the air. And even if I don't get a response or something, it's like it's important for me to just like let people know how I feel. Were you seeing somebody at the time when you did this line? Uh, I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it was like a long term, been on and off kind of thing. I don't, to be honest, I don't remember how significant it was at the moment. I do remember things like rekindled as, as like, I don't know, all the stardom or, or like the attention and stuff like that it's kind of like she like grabbed onto me to make sure that people knew (laughs) or something i don't know wait what do you mean what do you mean well like we were like like, together we were like together but not i don't know um it was like yeah like i said an on and off thing and then 
um, at the after once, like literally after it happened, once a video came out, like this, I was like, there was, I had this week where I went on like every like news, like breakfast talk show and fucking radio and just a lineup of different things, you know? And it was, yeah, I, she was by my side, you know, which was, it was a great help at the time, but same time, I don't know. I don't know what the intention was or whatever. I'm sure. I don't know. I don't look into it. That's not a not a subject I really care to. Yeah, yeah. To dive yeah. into it, because I was gonna say, is that like attention grabbing or like it, it's it's latching onto the victory at that point? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, yeah. She had she had told me before. Yeah, yeah. Like she didn't want. She thought she felt nervous about. It. I felt like there was times she had kind of slowed me down in my progression, and maybe that's why there was the space at the time. But yeah. after the success, it's a little easier to. It's you know, hard accept it. <laughs> yeah. yeah cause same in my experience. Uh, a significant other will will get in your head and be like, I don't feel comfortable about this. And you're like, why are you texting me this the day of? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Like we had conversations. Yeah. Why are you yeah. doing this? I want support, not this. Yeah. 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 And I don't think those people understand that. Oh, I can't say that. I was going to say like, they're putting your life at risk, but in a sense, they, it really is. Cause it affects you tremendously. Well, as two single people, I think that we could say that, uh, it, it probably isn't going to work out if that's the way that it is. But they love you, right? I can't, yeah. I can't fault them for for being that way, right? Yeah, love's a fucked up thing. <laughs> yeah. But like, what would you expect somebody that really cares about you if you're putting your life on a line like that? Would you just, ex- you know, there, there's that like Alex Holland mom that's like, well, this is what he loves to do, so I just gotta accept it. Yeah. But still, he's not telling her like the day that he's doing that, right? No, I mean, I'd say my relationship with my mom is very similar to that. It's like she obviously it scares the fucking shit out of her, you know, but she's also seen what I've accomplished and how happy it makes me and that it is my life. And, and she's proud of me. She's proud of everything that I've ever done. You know what I mean? But she's also very scared, you know, and naturally I am scared when my dog walks too close to the edge of the cliff. I could only imagine what my mother thinks of me and what I do, you know? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, like I want to interview your mom, but that was kind of the situation, right? Like before well, I yeah, wanted to get her. I, I've kind of put her on the spot before and, and asked her to do interviews and things like that. And, and I asked her and she said, you know, if you really want me to do it, then I will. But to be honest, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's not super comfortable talking about it. You know, it was an emotional, um, thing for her anyway. And so on, on the day of right after I walked this line, I'm now by myself on the third peak and I have to scramble up and around and, and then I meet up with my friends. And first thing I do, I'm like, can I have my phone? I need to call my mom. And then I just like sit down and I'm like, mom, Hey, you know, it's like, Hey, how are you? I'm like, well, I'm fantastic. I actually just broke the world record free solo. And she goes, oh my God, that's great. Um, Jim and I just, um, we just, yeah, we're, we put a bit in on this condo and she just changed the subject. And, and, and uh, of course, I mean, whatever. Anytime I would tell her about dangerous things that I was doing, she would try to not pay attention, say, okay, you know, stay supportive, but also try to not actually think about it too much. And then it was the next day all of a sudden, you know, a little bit of social media and this and that. And she actually reads it. She goes, Oh my God, I can't believe I like changed the subject. So I remember her calling me being really upset and apologizing of the way that she reacted. And like, it was fine. I understood. I, I got it. But yeah, it was just funny. It was just funny. Yeah. Well, that is funny. Cause at first you were coming off as if she wanted to change the subject cause she was uncomfortable, but there's a risk that she was just changing the subject cause she didn't understand. And that is a reality is like our parents, typically don't really know these outdoor sports and like what is a big deal to us yeah. to them is like oh well yeah, i know yeah i know you do your thing out there on the slack line yeah you, you do the, the day that i call her to tell her that i broke a world record in, in the same sense of her wanting to not hear any of the dangerous things that i'm doing she's like yeah, well, yeah okay cool great <laughs> yeah, beer too. yeah yeah oh, i was just nice. i knew this one was close yeah cheers cheers, cheers. what's it like when you observe like LJ, your your ex, when she was doing like what she do paragliding and stuff. Yeah, what do you feel? I'll just change it to other people, just because. But when I watch other people do dangerous things, it makes me way more nervous than when I'm doing it. Um, I've watched other people free solo. I watched the guy break my world record, and it scared the shit out of me. You know, I'm also like very aware of the mind state, probably more comfortable than other people. But man, I understand why. You know, it'd be really hard to watch and 
And when you're not in control yourself, that's when it's scary, you know, and, uh, base jumping, you know, like I've, I've mentored friends now. It's like, I'm in no position to actually mentor anybody. And my buddy, Jake, I've gave him his first base jump. I've taught him how to pack. I've brought him off the cliff for the first time. I've got him started. And, and, you know, now he goes and jumps by himself and we're doing a rope swing. He actually, you know, just got caught by the rope funny and, and he ended up breaking his back. So he had a few months off. How does that happen? I uh, did. He did a rope swing and basically just took a mo- monster whipper, you know, like imagine a 70 meter whipper, but it, it wasn't absorbing the, the catch. Yeah, I mean, he just I, Cause he hucked flips. So I think he just kind of opened up and the, the probably didn't crank down the harness tight enough, like the five point. Um, but anyway, he, he just got back from that injury and I was at home. It was like last, last Sunday, a week ago, <laughs> he, uh, he's like, Hey, I'm going to go for a jump. You want to come? And I'm like, ah, I'm just kind of tired. I'm not really feeling it, whatever. He's like, all right, well, I'm going. And then, you know, an hour later I get a text from him. He's like, yeah, I'm at the hospital. And it's like, man, it crushed me. It like, I've, I, Oh, it crushed me, you know, and all of a sudden I think of like, what if it was a call from somebody else saying that he just went in and it's like, oh man, like, <sighs> so like, as I feel even, it's not even just my friend going out doing something, but I feel this like responsibility over watching, you know, watching them. The same thing when somebody gets on a high line that I've rigged and they weigh a little more than I do and I watch them whip, but <sighs> you know, um, yeah, it's, it's nerve wracking watching other people do dangerous things. But mm-hmm. when you know their capabilities at a certain point, you have to kind of let go and trust. Why don't you break down a little bit of watching your world record being broken, saying you feel scared as shit, right? Yeah. yeah. But does it make you reflect on your own, your own entourage that had to watch you do it? Yeah. I mean, me watching Freedy uh, do it, it was at Hunlin Falls. It's in the Slack Life series that uh, Levi has. Which is where? Where is it? It's on YouTube. It's all on YouTube for free. Uh, Levi, by the way. I'm Levi Allen is, is or Left, Left Coast, Coast Media. Media. Yeah. yeah. Filmed this award-winning, untethered, un- I can't pronounce that. Untethered. Untethered. Yeah, untethered. <laughs> untethered. <laughs> <Yeah>. untethered. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he's the cinematographer that filmed that. We'll put up his credits on YouTube so you guys can watch the video. But anyway, he filmed the series and the world record being rebroken. Yes. Yeah. He actually wasn't the drone operator at the time. That was uh, Zach Moxley. He, uh, Levi wasn't available the day that I went up and I just messaged Zach. I'm like, Hey, if you're available, I might be doing something rad today. And he actually just showed up at the time. So, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's where like the, the single clip of the world record it's on his, but yeah. So Freedy uh, steps on the line and like, well, the day before he was walking it in a way that I knew what he was planning to do. You know, he's a really good slack liner, really good at like bouncing and doing tricks and stuff. And when you see a guy like that, just tiptoeing across the line, super carefully, it's like, you know, exactly what he's thinking about. And what is he thinking about? He's thinking about taking his leash off and free soloing it, right? But I mean, for me, this line, it's next to a waterfall and like there's so much motion and everything going on. It like, it was gnarly as far as I was concerned for like a line to free solo, but he stood up and he, he just crushed it. He was listening to some fucking techno too. He likes it like deep. Yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing to see it. And he was probably more than capable of soloing the line that I did when I did it, but his mind wasn't there or he didn't have the motivation, whatever it was. And I do believe that I inspired him. So I like, I love the fact that like my spirit brought somebody who was already better to like realize their potential or something, you know, cause he was always so at such a higher level than me in slacklining. And he was around during the filming of Untethered, he's, the, you know, he's in it, Freedy, and he's way better than I am. He's crushing this stuff, you know, and then it's like cut to me soloing a line longer than he ever had or anyone ever had. And yeah, so I feel like I, I definitely sparked that with him and made him realize the potential that he had. That's cool. And how did you feel as far as like passing on the flame? Stoked. Soaked, man. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's a little part of you, you know, you're like, ah, I don't have it anymore, but I also wasn't like, I, I had an, uh, uh, a torn meniscus. So like I was kind of learning to stand up on a slack line in a different way. And I wasn't free soloing at the time. And it wasn't like I was some competing factor that was like really devastated that I didn't have it anymore. You know, it was like, well, it's time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to get into like the why a little bit. Do you think a certain percentage of it is based on ego and leaving a legacy? Uh, I honestly don't believe that my ego had anything to do with it. 
I really believe like at the time it's been, it, it was just like the natural progression of like where I got to, because I had tried to do it in a time before, but I wasn't willing to push myself beyond what I was capable of, you know, and that's an ego check. You're not going to do something that your life depends on for ego. Otherwise you're kind of flipping a coin, you know, you're, I don't know. It's like, you need to have your, your intentions aligned. Mm. Being comfortable not succeeding is, is okay, you know, but it's like, yeah. And I feel like I'm not, I'm relatively humble about like you, anyone asks, I'm not the best slackliner in the world. I never at one, at no point in my life have I ever been, you know, I think that at that point I was the strongest mentally also with the availability of this spot and, and the people to help me rig and all of that, like all of these things add up to this point. It's not that I'm some magnificent person that made all of this happen. It happens through, you know, helping other people, other people helping you and everything coming together, like the weather, the wind, the the right people sitting on the rock. Like maybe if Michael didn't have his dick out, maybe I wouldn't have felt comfortable. You know what I mean? It's like, it all happens for a reason. It all works out in the end. And it's not solely because of me. And I can't turn around and say that it was, it's all me. You know, it's not, there's no ego saying that I did this. It's like, I did it through those OG slackliners teaching me what they taught me. I did it through my best friends uh, checking my stuff because they're smarter than me and they know, you know, I did it through all of those things and I give credit to all of those people for all of those things because it, I could not have done any of these things by myself. It's a funny thing about the sport, right? You're out on the line, you're absolutely alone, but go try, go try to rig a line on your own. It's, you can do it, but it sucks, man. It's not something you, you do. How do you do that again? Like logistically, how do you get the line across? Uh, it depends. Yeah. Uh, for that one, for that one, uh, I actually used, I rented, a, a rope gun from a rescue store, uh, in town. It takes 22 caliber blanks and a foam projectile. And yeah, you fucking fire this thing across. Oh shit. Mm-hmm. And that's just the, just the tag. Yeah. So that'd be like a light string. Yeah, yeah. And then with that, you'd pull over. Uh, I mean for that length of line, we actually, I think at that time we were just using like paracord. And pulling it across. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And I also saw that the is it behind the scenes where you guys tow another line with the drone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> for sure. So yeah, it, that's the most common way of doing that. Now. Really, droning? Oh, yeah. Droning for, lines across? Yeah, I have a Mavic. Well, like my company owns the Mavic, and it's like literally that's all. I don't even put a SD card in it. It's like literally my it's a rigging tool. Really? Yeah. What's your company? Uh, Slack Life BC. Okay. So we yeah we sell Slack line gear. Oh, no shit. Yeah, we do a lot huh? of we've done a lot of different stuff over the years, but that's the the base of our of our company. Oh, sick! Yeah, I'll mm-hmm. put the link up. Yeah, for sure. So, again, though the the why is it? It's just a progression thing for you. That's like why you want to get it done. I just yeah, it's because it's what I wanted to do. You know, it's like literally, it's just why why anything why do anything you know the and it's like because i'm privileged enough to to be able to take time to mess around in the mountains and do this sort of thing you know like because i visualized it happening because i said it out loud that i wanted it you know like you don't need a why you really don't you just need a what (laughs) you're like where you know yeah it's true and it it is interesting the whole privilege thing it it is kind of a uh, my life is going well enough where i can afford to do this kind of risk but like you know in like third world country you have a family to support you're not gonna like Mm -hmm. you're not gonna break the world record (laughs) well i mean you're yeah you're taking extra risk at that point right What, what do you have to lose yeah yeah what type of people would you think really push themselves in these kind of outrageous ways like you know would there be a similarity between you and honald there be a similarity within you and dean potter what type of character uh, tend to i'm engage not in this? i'm not really sure you know and i think that you know you know of me you know of dean you know of alex but there's also a ton of people out there that do just as gnarly stuff that you just don't know about it mm. you know i think that's like the big thing is like it's quite common in people, you know, but it's, it's only now with this new, with the way that everyone knows everything that everyone's doing, you know, you have this ideal that, oh, if somebody does some long free solo, it's going to be, there's going to be a video, it's going to be posted, everyone's going to know about it. But like, quite frankly, there's a lot of things that could have been done that nobody knows about it. I b- believe like, you know, in climbing or in many senses, lots of things have happened that like are just simply word of mouth. And the person doesn't really care to be acknowledged for it, you know? So I have such I respect that, for those people. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. 
I really do because it's really hard to not be like, hey, I did this. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard to not be uh, proud of it, you know? Yeah. What do you think differentiates those people from like people like even myself or yourself, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm not sure. I think, uh, yeah, I think they're doing it for the right reasons. You know, I think like I've, I struggle in posting stuff on Instagram and stuff like that. Like, cause I just find like, <sighs> everyone's so like fake and bullshit, you know? And I just, I feel like I just post the same thing over and over. And it's like, I kind of have like the, the, I have like uh, semi obligations, you know, through sponsors and stuff like that, where I kind of need to like, you know, promote stuff and do whatever. And it's cool to like show the world. But like, I also just like, don't really care. I have so much cool footage that no one's ever seen, but also it's like not really important for me to just go like, this is what I'm doing always. You know, my life is super great. It's like, yes, I like to throw something out there here and there, let people know I'm alive, still doing stuff. But like, yeah, I get tired of doing stories every day and Mm. yeah, saying this is me, you know, I'm not big on it. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a lot of people think that I should capitalize on my online presence or popularity or whatever but it's like honestly i could give two shits it kind of bothers me that some days i'm people recognize me and i'm i'm just out in a mood walking my dog or whatever so i was like oh hey man i recognize you from the movie it's like that's really cool i really like that but i also not in the mood (laughs) i don't know you know so i've learned through that and just the constant same questions over and over again no offense to you right now (laughs) you know i've been asked the same questions over and over about the same things you know and i'm totally fine answering them but there's a time and a place you know and some people don't always get that so i'd almost prefer to keep my things a little bit more private nowadays let's be real like in in a sense you're kind of famous within this like small community but to be truly famous oh that sounds like the worst that sounds like the worst thing yeah. like you could ask for. Yeah. Right? Like Yeah. Well, yeah, like I was saying, we last year we filmed a, a TV show for Discovery Channel that'll be coming out in June. It'll be on Discovery Plus, yeah. um, their new streaming platform. And we just had a meeting about how like I need to make all my shit private and I need to like make sure my phone number isn't on the internet. I don't say where I'm actually at in the moment of being at that place because it'll just be so different. It's like on the, on the on the subject that I was the way that I just put it I you know like I'm not fucking stoked about that at all yeah. right now I'm interested to see what happens I know that that's a little bit you know our show is a little bit different than like the average one but uh, yeah I don't know if I'm looking forward to it or not what's the reason for that what's Sto- that like stalkers or like yeah yeah exactly I mean people that you don't want to know where you are the people that want to know like a fan or whoever that like thinks that it'll be cool to show up at your house and say hi but like have you experienced like slacklining groupies <laughs> i mean it's it's funny i think most most real slackliners are pretty chill it's it's funny when i meet somebody and i don't ever expect that they know who i am and i introduce myself and like oh cool you know and like after a period of time once they feel comfortable they're like hey man i'm actually like i actually like i'm a huge fan and it's not i love that i like when somebody's real with me it's weird when someone's just like hey man oh my god yeah it's like calm down i'm a stoner who walked the line with Eddie Lee Sean, right? Just settle down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably better than I am. I just figured it out in my head. You know, I don't know. Well, it sounds like you, at least you, like you do it for the right reasons. Like I've heard many solos say, like, like myself, I don't push those limits in any sense, shape, or form. But having gone through a breakup recently too, like I'm, I'm in a place where I, I don't know, I have the urge to solo and i i do but it's not pushing any yeah. boundaries no, no, for sure but it's still like uh, it's not a good because you're looking place. inside right now you're like talking to the internal person you know and that's like once you don't have that partner that you're like constantly like interacting with and speaking with and helping or them helping you it's like all of a sudden you're like you're yourself you're dealing with your own entity now you know and it's like soloing is that you know you're not dealing with your climbing partner you're dealing with yourself you're climbing you know that you're in control you know that you're safe because of the feel of your feet and your hands on the rock you know and that's what life is you know all of a sudden you're relying on your belay partner to catch you if you fall well sometimes you don't have that you know and that's it's probably why your mind's going there i get that too you know i get in a mood and i'll just put some music on go hike and jump off a cliff you know Mm. Fucking sick. Fucking sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but like for me, it's not natural. I'm afraid of heights, man. Like I straight up don't like the heights. Are you like, really? Or are you afraid of hitting the ground? Yeah, that's everyone's got that right. But no, yeah. no. I was like, I was straight up that person. Like you know, you go to cl- next to like a cliff, and I'm like inching mm. over the ledge, like 
Oh. Like on all fours. Like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck that, dude. Like, fuck that, right? So it's not natural for me to to do things that are like soloing and stuff. And I don't know. I feel like uh, maybe a part of me, is, yeah, it, it's that like I don't want to rely on anyone. But also it's like out of sadness or something. I don't know. Yeah. Ever- but see, I, every, I'm also very afraid of heights, I could say, because I definitely arrive at a cliff and I'm like, whoa, I'm scared of falling off. That's, that's my fear of heights, but not until I've spent enough time around that cliff. I trust the grip of my shoes, the, this and that. I'm aware of my surroundings that I become a little bit more comfortable with it, you know? So of course, everyone's afraid of heights. That's evolution, but it's learning to be comfortable in that situation that is like key that you've, you know, you climb, right? It's like, you've learned, right? You get more going. And then soloing, it's the same thing. You're like, this is scary. But I know my surroundings, I'm comfortable, I'm calm, I know that I'm safe because of A, B, and C, you know, whatever, yeah. But I still, I, I don't think I have that, like, mindset, like, honled of full-on trust to me. It's always like, oh, I could fucking die. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I could yeah. fucking die. Like, yeah. and it's always there, like, in, the, in you know, I'll look yeah. around, I'm like, But that's I don't usually know. what keeps you alive. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's true. When I guess when you get casual, that's when you get complacent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, so one of the questions I saw on your Instagram when someone was asking is, have I ever backed out of a solo? Yep. yep. Right? Uh, So when Dean Potter died, I felt an urge that I should go up, rig his line, and free solo it as like an homage to him. And and I had already soloed it before. I was very current in soloing. But I went up there that day. I stood on it. I took a couple of steps out. And then I just sat down. And then I like look back and I'm like, no, I don't think I'm feeling it today. And I just got this feeling. I don't know what it was. And I backed out. Yeah. yeah. And you walked down. You walked well, away. Yeah, yeah. And I walked away. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't solo it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So that was, and I had already soloed this line before. It wasn't like some groundbreaking new thing. It just simply wasn't the time. I don't know. I just gave me some feeling. It wasn't, wasn't digging it. So maybe I went there to pay homage to him, but maybe paying homage to him by falling off and dying wasn't the right thing. And that's what might've happened had I pushed beyond whatever, you know? Mm. So I don't know. Listen to your gut sometimes. I literally had that the other day. I drove up with a plan in mind, ended up getting distracted, doing something else for part of the day. And then I was like, oh, I'm still want to, like I had that plan in my head. Yeah. So then I went, Drove to the parking lot, looked at it, and I was like, no, nah, you should walk away. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't. To free solo something? Yeah. yeah. I was like, no. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And you got to listen to yourself. And then there's also days where I've, I've kind of like, you try to talk yourself out of it, but you just keep moving towards it in ways. You know, I do that with jumping all the time where I'm like, ah, I don't want to go jump today. I look outside and then I'm like, it is pretty calm. <sighs> no, it's all right, though. It's all right. And then it's like walking around and you're like, mm. well, maybe I'll like just go to the parking lot and see what it looks like, you know? Well, you'll just start walking. I don't know. See how I feel. And the next thing you know, you're at the exit and you're like, fuck, I guess I'm jumping off, aren't I? <laughs> you just, I don't know what happens, you know? How did that progression happen? Because I, I feel like slacklining, some people could argue it's not necessarily an adrenaline sport, but I think it's kind of hard to deny that base jumping is not an adrenaline sport. It's all adrenaline in the way that you're like, putting it out there you know you're going to places that people haven't done it's elevated heart rates it's like all of that right base jumping to me it's like i just hiked up and looked down so many times that it's like i got really comfortable with the abyss i got comfortable with like that place there and i had a really healthy desire to jump off of it you know and like i did rope swings and stuff like that and uh an old local here, Treehouse Mike, I used to run into him in the parking lot all the time. He was like the local base jumper hooligan. And, and uh, I begged him for years to, to let me base jump. But it's like, you have to go skydive. That's it. You go skydiving if you want to base jump. And so uh, he, he showed up to the premiere of Untethered. And he was like, man, I'm proud of you. This and that. I am going to let you base jump but it's in one place and one place only i'll call you with the details so he calls me brings me out to this place where it's a bridge and a big snowy bowl and it's like okay you know you gotta do what you gotta do you know like he gave me the rundown what to do and i did it and that's called death camp you know it's like sky or base jumping with zero experience so you hadn't skydived uh, I had done two skydives at this point so i did start i tried but i also ran out of time and money and 
skydivers are kind of like climbers in the weird way in comparison, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so then, yeah, uh, the, the next year I was down in Moab, Utah at this Highline Festival and, and I kept begging him to, to let me jump off the cliff and he kept saying no. And I kind of, t- we made a deal and he let me do it. And, and, uh, so I had like this taste, you know, and after that I went, I got my solo, uh, license for skydiving, but yeah, I had like 13 jumps or something. And then I didn't jump for a year. I did one more base jump, but sketchy Andy put a rig on me and let me open up the space net, be the first jump out of it, which is super cool and honor. Wait, what is that? A space net? Space net. It's like the net rigged out in the middle of the canyon. Like okay. we rig it with slack lines and it's like a big giant flat net you can walk on it jump off of it oh. and stuff yeah Wait, it's a slack line over net no no it's like it's uh yeah it's just like a big net and then the corners are tensioned by like a slack by slack lines okay yeah and so you, it's like this one's big this one's like 500 square feet okay. and it has a big hole in the middle of it that you can pop through yeah, it's super cool but anyway yeah so after that uh treehouse actually passed away and he was the one that was always like you need this experience before you base jump and this and that. And I kind of just felt this like weird feeling of like, I am just going to buy a parachute now. And I did. And then I went down to Utah and I did some jumps off a bridge in Idaho. And basically I would not suggest that anybody ever follows the same path that I did. I got lucky. I have continued to get lucky, but you need to skydive a whole bunch to learn how to fly the canopy. I think that I'm, very well endowed in my skills of running and jumping off a cliff and my body awareness while I'm doing so. Um, but when the parachute opens up and I need to land on the ground, unless you know what you're doing, you're just going to hurt yourself. And if something goes wrong, your parachute opens your face in the cliff, you're going to fucking smack the cliff. And I mean, if you're canopy, def- you know, like there, you, you're going to die if something goes wrong and you don't know how to fly the canopy. And quite frankly, I got really lucky and I learned the hard way. You know, I learned through crashing and, and yeah, every person around me told me that I was an idiot for the way I was doing it. But I also continued. And at a certain point, some people are like, okay, I'm going to just give you this advice, even though I know that you shouldn't, but I know that you're going to do it anyway. And you're better off doing it with my advice. (laughs) But now I'm at like 200 and something base jumps. And like, I've learned a lot with only two free dives. No, I'm now at uh, well, I mean, I've done legitimate uh, drop zone skydives. I've done, I think, 13 or 14. And then I've done another five now that are just out of a buddy's plane. But the etiquette is, I, I've heard 200, right? Yeah, like you that's like do, generally what they say. But yeah, 200. 200 skydives is not going to teach you to run and jump off a cliff. Right. That's something that that's a whole other set of skills that the numbers that people say, it doesn't apply to everybody because a real number might be 500 for someone. You know, I know people with a thousand skydives that don't ever want to base jump because they think it's too scary or dangerous or whatever, you know. Is slacklining in the back burner now? Um, a little bit. You know, I, I do still have, I don't care so much about the act of slacklining or highlining like just in general like at the local spots but if we're like hey let's go up to that mountain peak and figure out how to rig a line and first we got to spend a day packing and then we're going to spend a day suffering and then another day suffering and then we might get a chance to walk it once but it's going to be in this epic beautiful location the anchors will probably only hold fucking just beyond what a whipper is so maybe don't whip on it i love that shit like <laughs> adventure highlining you know oh yeah that's it's not thing. so much about what because honestly like not i don't know how like you know without sounding dickish or whatever but it's fucking easy man it really once you learn it, it is easy and once you get beyond just walking like there's a, a range of things you can do to up the your you know to challenge yourself by doing tricks and different things but i'm just not into that like the walking like man i haven't I would not, I didn't walk a line for like three months. I got on one line, kind of struggled. That was like 200 meters long. And then uh, a week later, after not slack lining at all, I got on a 500 meter long line and walked it first try. And then not high lining at all for another probably month. And then I got on a 650 meter long line. I walked it first try there and back in like 17 minutes or something, like just running across it, you know? And it's like, I feel like I have the skills to do it. I have the mindset to do it. I'm just not that excited to do it on like the regular basic level, you know? 
What's going through your mind when you're doing a long ass line like that? And is it the same thing that's going through your mind when you were soloing across the chief? No, no, it, it's like, uh, I am so close to falling in every moment walking those long lines. I feel like I'm trying to get speed. I am not Mr. Endurance, so I need to get across it fast, you know? So I'm trying to walk fast. I'm trying to walk just in the amount of control that I need, which once you kind of let go and your legs are moving, you actually find this point where you're just dialed and you're moving. But yeah, to cross the line in like 17 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it was, it was short. That seems like so long to be balancing. Yeah, but you're moving, you know, and it's like as you walk the line, the line changes. So like the beginning of it, you've got a mile ahead of you and these long lines are segmented in 50 meter sections. So you like get to a point and you like know that you're at 50 meters, okay, 50 meters, 50 meters. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, fucking, how many is that? You're like, oh shit, okay, just quit thinking about it. Just keep walking, you know? It's like really, again, smoking a little bit of weed, having a really good like mix, like an hour long, like house mix or something that just keeps you keeps you going not like a playlist because then this track track ends and then the next song comes on and it changes like you need something to keep you fluent and in the same mind state and oh yeah those like constant songs right? yeah like, exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. you put on like a like a mix right oh, like so a, never from ends. dj's live mix oh, from, yeah, from yeah, the party yeah. you went yeah, to done that. That's, yeah. oh dude it's yeah. good yeah and they like bring you into it get you fucking rocking and then either end with a bang or like you know bring you back down it's good. Find it on SoundCloud. I just pick a good mix and, you know, all sorts of different DJs. And But what's going through your mind when you're soloing? I want to know, like, is there something you're constantly repeating, like words or something? Keep walking. Keep walking. Like, yeah, step, keep walking or that's, catch. That's what's going in your mind? Yeah. Keep Either walking. Either keep walking or catch. <laughs> Probably the two things. Nothing else? Nothing else is leaking in? Nope. No. no. Uh, it's maybe at the very end. That's when you're like... Yeah, like I uh, oh, no, you just keep fucking going. So, folks that described this, and like even in the video, that they, they address the relief of being with you, like being present with you, not necessarily. And Maya, I think Maya was a good person to have there because she wasn't freaking out. She wasn't giving you those bad vibes. No. Personally, like I've had that. I have like a, a solo where it was going so well and I see a crowd of people and I hear those fucking whispers like, oh, yeah. oh my God, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, in my head, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly yeah. 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 I like want to like yell in the crowd like, don't fucking look at me. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, knowing your surroundings in those moments, right? Because yeah. it can, things can switch. But she described being present with you, not necessarily being nervous, just observing and kind of a blank mind mm -hmm. being locked in with you. But once you're off, like, and once you said, I'm not, I'm not going to walk it back. I'm going to walk around. Yeah. Everyone being like, oh, thank fucking Lord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How did it feel when, once you're done? Did, was there any sadness? No, dude. I honestly I had tears in my eyes, hundred percent. I was, it was emotional. It was really nice to be over there by myself. I sat down for a second and I just like cried for a second. You know, it was like really, it was really emotional. I had fucking goosebumps. It was like it was a dream. It didn't even just happen. You know, it was like, whew, here I. It was a lot. You know, a lot and like just that. Fuck, there was a lot of emotion, a lot of adrenaline, a lot of like everything, and it just felt like I felt empowered. I felt like I could fuck you know do anything you know it felt really fucking good like whew. and then the when i walked around by myself there was like somebody sitting at the at the peak you know they didn't they had no idea what had just happened and i just just walked past them you know just like i don't know it just felt felt great felt fantastic there's no there's no feeling like i haven't i'd I've had lots of great feelings of accomplishment and like, I'm stoked that I did these things, but like, man, that the feeling of that, like the true, how long it took me to build up to getting there, um, standing up and catching, th thinking in my head, fuck, do I really want to do this? Yes, I do want to do this. <laughs> okay. Walking, fighting, struggling, screaming, cruising. Wow. You know, like just, yeah. Good feeling. Could potentially end it there. <laughs> yeah. extending it just for my own personal curiosity were there those moments where you had already said that you're gonna do it and you're like eh, why like should i though like sh maybe i shouldn't up until the moment of standing up the last moment like you know absolutely yeah when i soloed it i had a harness on 
and I had a, a carabiner with me because I knew that like when I fell in the middle of Dean's line, I shimmied back, but it was 30 meters long. So now imagine I'm in the middle of the 64 meter long line and I don't, I'm not going to stand up free solo in the middle of it. I don't think anyway. And so this is my plan B. I can give up at any moment, catch the line and secure myself and slide back. You know, something that like Alex Honnold or anyone who climbs rock climbing, there's no out where I had an out, you know, and it's like me talking about how I like, I would always catch it. I was trusting this is my, that's how I justified me being safe to the absolute extent, even if halfway through, I decided I wasn't going to do it. That's like an ethical thing in soloing, or it's like a, how people view it thing. I've considered doing specific lines, climbing with a harness and a couple mm. pieces of gear. And, yeah. and I was like, yeah, if I get scared, I'll put in some gear, I'll climb a little more, put in yeah. some gear. Yeah. Sure, I'll, like, I'll shock load it if I fall, but at least it'll be there and I'll, I'll feel better mentally. Mm. But then the other part of you is like, well, that's not how you do it. That's not- no, for sure, yeah. But I mean, if you use it, then you use it. If you don't, you still soloed. I don't but you really, solo but with of course, a harness sure, and some gear. Some purist might tell you that, yes, you are not soloing, but any person that ever questioned me, I asked them to go to the middle of a 64-meter line, solo, stand up in the middle, and see if it feels any safer with a harness on. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's It doesn't. One. It doesn't. Yeah. What is the hardest point on the, the traverse? I'd say like in, in for any free solo, the first step is the hardest, the first couple of steps, standing up tough, but taking actually like picking up your feet that are seem stuck in that moment, you know, that's the hardest part for sure. Getting the engine revving. Yeah. But once it's moving, the middle is not more wobbly. Uh, no, because in the middle, you're kind of in control of both sides, at least in a line this, this length. Um, when you're at one end or the other, you have like a mass amount of weight on the line in front of you, and you're trying to control a lot more of the line. It's harder to control at a longer length, like on its own. When you're in the middle of it, you're like more in control of the whole general weight of the line, right? Mm. But that all depends on tension and a lot of different things. And the other question I just wanted to know is like, one of the things that Maya mentioned she said when you do these things that you do got to think the impact of a death would be more impactful on the people, your surroundings more so than yourself. Yeah. Do you ever, how do you, I think of it like that when I climb, I'm like, I feel like it's kind of a selfish endeavor. I still love it. Mm-hmm. How do you justify it in your own mind? A, it makes me happy. It would, it would, I would not be myself if I didn't follow my passions or my goals or where, for whatever reason I decided to do these things. If I decided to do it because of someone or something else, I wouldn't really be happy. Um, probably the most selfish thing I've ever done was Christmas morning. I didn't have a mimosa or, or, or Bailey's in my coffee. And I left my parents' house in North Van with all of my family. I drove up and I jumped off the chief and then I went back and it was like, man, I'm walking up the chief and I'm like, what a idiot. I like, honestly, what if something happened right now? It's bad enough on any other day, but I literally just walked away from like being gathered with my family. Um, I'm very aware of all of that. I've, I've seen death in the community. I've seen how it affects family and friends. I'm very aware of all of it. And so through that, I just try to be true to myself and my goals and also let people know how much I love them or how much I hate them (laughs) or whatever it is. You know what I mean? I try to stay true to myself and let people know. And so that I do believe that from what I've expressed in my life, to my close loved ones that if I were to die, it's not like it's going to make it easier, but there's a, I've talked about it. You know, I've, I've let people know what my mind state is and that I'm understand and comfortable with it. And it doesn't mean they have to be, but I feel like, yeah, I'm, I, you know, no part of me wants to die. I want to live, be very old and continue doing all of this, but I also understand that it could happen. And well, I was going to ask like, you want to be an old man? I'll be miserable, old man, if I get there. But yeah, yeah, for sure. Who doesn't want to keep living life and crushing it? You know, absolutely. All of us. I have zero intention of dying. I'm scared shitless. That's why I haven't done a gainer or base jumping. That's why I haven't 
done a lot of different things that I would love to do, but I'm afraid, you know, I'm very afraid. And so I inch forward and through inching forward, I've accomplished a lot, you know, so I'll just continue inching forward when I'm comfortable, when it's time, I'll do it. And you know, whatever, what? shit, shit happens, man. Why do you say miserable, man? Oh, because I've poured concrete for 15 years. I've had fucking knee injuries, hand injuries, back, shoulder, whatever it is, you know, I'm going to be sore. <laughs> that's, that's about it and, and and successfully i will be sore because yeah. i lived a good life you know yeah yeah you earned the injuries yeah for sure any parting words um yeah i don't know yeah the the same old like if you have a dream you go out there and do it it doesn't have to happen the next day it doesn't have to be death defying or whatever it is yeah like too many people have their goals aligned with uh financials and i really believe that i mean if, if money makes you happy then okay but i don't find that money makes me happy i find it brings me trouble and and uh useless things that i don't need i find the purest thing is just you know going out and doing the things that i love it's there's nothing more rewarding than accomplishing goals that's it. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Man. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> you smell that? I think I smell a rating and a review on the Apple Podcasts and a subscription on YouTube. Oh, you're so kind and generous. And if you want to help support the guest, Spencer, then you can go to Slack Life BC. And if you want to check out the phenomenal film that we talked about the whole episode, it's called Untethered by Levi Allen. Great watch. Bye.